Today, I declare the fault of all the floods and rain is with the conservatives of Texas. <laughs> that God's wrath has been wrecked on our state. Anti-gay, anti-women, end times agendas have failed to understand that it wasn't the fire next time, but the flood. <laughs> Didn't they know the flood brought the rainbow sign? <laughs> Okay, you know I'm kind of kidding about that. <laughs> I don't believe in God's wrath, or a God that would be wrathful. I do believe that an end times understanding of the world can bring about floods, because it fails to understand that the here and now is important. If you promote a religion that looks to a short future that is primarily for your own good and the few, you fail to commit to a long-term environmental policy. You create war. You promote war and you promote a failure in the environment to address real issues. And if not that, <laughs> You fail in your amazement of the world. You see, when a church downtown promotes a page on the Dallas Morning News that says the world is coming to an end because of those Muslims or those gay people, it is a failure of imagination. But it is also a failure of the amazement of the variety of the world that we exist in. Wislawa Samborska, in her Nobel Peace Prize speech, said this. This is the poet that you heard just before, that Beth read. She said, the world, Whatever we might think about it, terrified by its vastness and by our helplessness in the face of it, embittered by its indifference to individual suffering of people, animals, and perhaps also plants. For how can we be sure that plants are free of suffering, she said as a side note. Whatever we might think about its spaces pierced by the radiation of stars, stars around which we now have begun to discover planets already dead, still dead we don't know whatever we might think she said about the immense theater to which we may have a ticket but it is valid for a ridiculously brief time limited by two decisive dates whatever else we might think about this world it is amazing end of sermon could have been, could have been, could have been, could have been, but it's not. The world is amazing. Here are some things I'm amazed about. Languages, bird migration, why certain notes in music make me feel something pressing on me or freeing my heart, how much food we can consume, the way a joke tickles us on the inside out, our capacity to lose track of time or care of another, the crowd mentality that wants us to burst through with either pride or hatred, of course the religious impulse and the historical trajectory of religions, all amazing things to me. That we go anywhere, that we do anything, that we don't give up, that we consider things important and some things not important, the list goes on. The world is amazing. End of sermon. <laughs> Not for the wise guy in the back corner. 
That would be too easy on an early summer sermon. We know it deep down in the heart. The world is amazing, but we also forget it so easily. Amazement. I remember moments in my life where amazement burst through, walking into a giant cistern in the Holy Land, dug out by people who lived thousands of years ago with a tour group chatting away as we walked into this immense room we weren't, didn't have to be told to quiet down in the face of an amazing thing. Just an architectural thing that slaked the thirst of human beings thousands of years ago who lived in stone homes like you and I who struggled with suffering and pain, with joy and celebration. We didn't have to be told to quiet down in that cistern. Amazement. I have had the same feeling in places that have echoed my steps like cathedrals and forested valleys, tops of mountains, in front of works of art, in small, insignificant roadside chapels, Amazement, awe, something that tickles us from the inside out, bursts us open for a world that declares it has its own integrity, and yet we human beings want to put a mark and say, yes, that, that thing is amazing, but the world doesn't need us to say that, which is amazing in itself. The redwoods of California, the perfect execution of a Beethoven piece, the Himalayan peaks, the statue of David, natural or man-made, these things amaze us. We go to the ends of the world to find them, to experience them. But Zimborska says, here. When Jacob was fleeing the wrath of his brother Esau in the story in the Bible, Jacob, the greatest biblical scoundrel there is, tricked his family out of the inheritance, ran from his brother, was then tricked into marrying two different women. The list goes on, the family dysfunction, horrendous. Now Jacob finds himself out in the wilderness again and before wrestling with God. He falls asleep, a stone for his head, and he dreams of a ladder stretching up to heaven between earth and heaven, throngs of angels. God stands at the top of the ladder, promises Jacob the land. When Jacob awakes, what does he do? He anoints the stone with oil names the place Bethel, the house of Elohim, the house of yud He vav He, the rock of the house of God. In a small chapel in the retreat center I go to each year in Southern California with my colleagues where we spend a week contemplating the important matters of the ministry this year, a colleague of mine, Mark Bellatini, led worship and brought a giant rock from the river and placed it in front of the pulpit and took oil and poured the oil on the rock and said, this is the house of God here. What does it mean, I say, to anoint a place? Anoint a place as holy as God's house here. 
Now, have you, you ever found yourself like Jacob in a limbo of your own making? <laughs> have you ever found yourself in unexpected places being found by God? What did that feel like? Did you ever make promises to God in gratitude or perhaps for persuasion in the wilderness of your life? Kneeling down. Please, help. I have. More than once. The rock in Jacob's story was the place between heaven and earth. It was the resting place. It was the stone for his head. Jacob, the flawed character from the story told thousands of years ago, points to us. Flawed characters with stories to tell here and now. It says, you over there in the fourth pew on the left. You can understand this place. Here is anointed. This place is between heaven and earth, house of God, wherever you put your head. House of God. If you're a deep woods wilderness camper, you know something about being way out in that wilderness kind of loneliness, but you don't have to be to understand it. Jacob encounters something out there in the dark on the road back to his father's homeland. Theologian Gene Tucker says, it's at great risk from the known behind him and unknown before him that Jacob travels. But it's worse, another said. Jacob is an unperson in an unplace, an immoral and irreligious rogue, not a religious seeker. He will have to be run to ground by God, who is not without the experience in handling hard cases. <laughs> in that moment, Jacob realizes his roguishness. He recognizes the moment at least that he is an unperson in an unplaced, alone, lost, maybe ill at ease, but eased by a stone, a pillow, eased as rogues can be eased sometimes just by sleep. Do you know any rogues who they just go to sleep no matter what? <coughs> in the midst of the chaos. Jacob stops at this place, his grandfather Abraham, when he reached the promised land. Barbara Brown Taylor observes that Jacob is on no vision quest. He has simply pushed his luck too far and has left town in a hurry. <laughs> he is between times and places in a limbo of his own making all alone in his limbo, full of anxiety, exhausted from his journey, and then a dream. Life on earth turns out quite cheap, the poet said. For dreams, for an instance, you don't pay a penny. A dream, a gift. God speaks, and he sees heaven and earth. Amazement at the here and now promises made in the dark. The story tells us we will not forget that the world is amazing. That's what the story tells us. And then when we find ourselves alone and exhausted in limbo, in a limbo of our own making, and if we are lucky, we can return to that notion of amazement in the world, a grounding, a knowing that the house of God resides under our heads. Here. And then we will return to what we are supposed to be, creatures among the many things in the world with amazing bodies and minds, where ignorance is hard at work and illusions carry us through so many moments in our lives. Jacob, no matter how alone he may have felt, understood in that moment 
in that moment something I'm trying to say to you. He understood that he belonged to something greater than himself. Jacob's aha moment, maybe a conversion of sorts, but not once and for all. He was not changed forever. He would forget again. Remember, he is the great scoundrel of the Old Testament. He would scheme again. He would work to gain God's favor again, return again and again, and also be amazed. He will wake up. He will have another dream. He will be alone and lonely again, but he will return to amazement in the world where the mundane becomes holy, the place between heaven and earth. Here. Here there is quite a lot of everything, the poet said. Here chairs are made in sadness and scissors and violins and tenderness and transistors and water dams and jokes and teacups. Here. Last week, Aaron spoke of being a southerner in the north and his persecution at Harvard. <laughs> I am a northerner in the south, to which you remind me often <laughs> in subtle and unsubtle ways with questions like, do you really like it here? <laughs> I'm not sure what's in that assumption, but here is where I serve, right, right here right here. Here is where my son was born. Here is where my home is. Here is where you are and where you go, I go. I got a good taste of here this past Monday on Memorial Day. For me, it was not a day of barbecues and picnics. I was there to spread ashes of a man who had died suddenly, a man I didn't know. And I got there early and I stood in front of the memorial stones and I read through the names. I have known almost half of the names on those stones for I have been here, here, 14 years almost. I read their names, I remembered their faces and their voices. I was there to spread ashes of a man I did not know but learned about in our grief class through a member of that class. Before the family arrived, I opened the container that we used to distribute the ashes, and inside there were ashes of some unknown person left behind, maybe persons. And so on Memorial Day, I spread those ashes before the stones. Like the unknown soldier, I said a prayer. I anointed the place with memory and said, I am here. Never more grounded than when handling the ashes of the dead. Reminded that we reside between the earth and heaven. The mundane becomes holy when we understand how amazing this world is, here in this place, here in this city, on this planet. It's not all rosy. <laughs> and I argued with Zimborska all week about this. Wars, wars, and wars, she says, but even between them there happen to be breaks. Attention. People are evil. Attention. People are evil. At ease, people are good. At ease, people are good. Attention. We produce wastelands. At ease, by the sweat of our brows, we build houses and quickly live in them. The poet reminds us, yes, there are wars, amazing ones also, and breaks. There are rains, there are floods, and there are breaks. And then the line, we don't do much to deserve all this. We pay 
for life dearly sometimes. Life on earth turns out quite cheap. For dreams, we don't pay a penny. For illusions, only when they're lost. For owning a body, only with the body. What grounds you, my friends, in the holiness of this amazing life? What amazes you? Or what keeps you from understanding the life you live is an amazement? And what does God say to you about your place in this world? I am not here to call you to action today. I am not here to solve your problems. I am here to ask you to simply and gently observe your life with a precious, holy passion that is not asleep to pain or suffering, but also not asleep to amazement. And then to anoint your place, house of God, this place between heaven and earth where promises are made, where God finds you in unexpected places, where you reside in a limbo of your own making. That's what I'm here to say to you today. In the words of the Christmas reading from Fra Giovanni, and why not? It's only the end of May. <laughs> I get near to the end of the sermon. Is that okay? <laughs> he writes, Fra Giovanni writes, Life is so full of meaning and purpose, so full of beauty beneath its covering, that you will find earth, but cloaks your heaven. Courage, then to claim it, that is all. But courage you have, and the knowledge that we are here, pilgrims together, wending through unknown country, our way home. After that, there is only one thing to say. Wislawa Samborska. Whatever we might think about this immense theater to which we may have a ticket, but it's valid for a ridiculously brief time, limited by two decisive dates, whatever else we might think about this world, it is amazing. End of sermon. <laughs> Amen. <laughs>